Good morning, church family and friends. Uh, welcome to another Sunday School session here at Calvary Presbyterian Church. If this is your first time watching, uh, my name is Angel Gomez. I serve as the associate pastor here at Calvary, and uh, we're glad that, that you've been able to tune in with us. Um, this is uh, the conclusion of a series in which we have been uh, tackling uh, tough questions that Christians face. And so we've entitled it Confronting Christianity, and we've been using this book as a, as a guide. Uh, it's not the only resource we've been looking at. However, um, it is one that we like. It, it's written uh, last year uh, of the same title, Confronting Christianity, Rebecca McLaughlin. And really, we're, we're battling with, wrestling with tough questions that Christians face. And today, admittedly, it's probably the toughest question there is. The question is, how could a, a loving God send people to hell? And it's, a, it's a tough question um, in and of itself, as, as far as a question goes. And so part of today, we're going to be looking at, should we even be asking that question? Years ago, I uh, had a friend who, uh, for a little extra cash, he would always be signing up for those focus groups. Do you, do you know what a focus group is? It's usually it's a group of researchers or a company uh, that would uh, hire people to come in for a couple hours. They would test an idea or a product or even a person upon them. They do this during political campaigns as well. And, and people then uh, are then uh, assessed uh, for how they reacted or or, or how they felt about a particular thing or, 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 or person or word. And so I'm going to ask you, imagine you were part of a focus group. And you're part of a focus group and I put a word in front of you and you were to kind of, you had a, a gauge, a, a meter, and you were to, to either go uh, highly positive on that meter or you're going to go very negative on that meter. And so preparing, you have your meters in front of you right now. And I would just say the word justice. And I, I'm guessing, I suspect that if I say the word justice, that most of us would turn that meter into that high, positive sounding. Like you would be like, yes, that's, I love justice. This is good. Justice is good. Um, and, then, and then I give you a second word, right? And I give you a second word and I say judgment. And, and I suspect for most of us that that, that, that meter would go strong, strongly negative. And there's definitely a disconnect between those two words, aren't there? There's a disconnect between those words, especially in the society that we live in. There's a disconnect between those two words, justice and judgment. And I'm going to propose that as, 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 as creatures made in the image of God, as human beings made in the image of God, that we innately actually need judgment and justice. That we, by original design, we want judgment. We want justice. And so, bear with me. I'm going I'm to go through this. And, and, and if you think I'm getting off track from the question, I am going to come back to it. Uh, but turn with me in your Bibles... We're going to look first at God's Word to see what He says about this. Uh, turn with me in your Bible. It says Psalm 96. Psalm 96. Psalm 96. It says, uh, starting with verse 11 through verse 13. And we're going to really focus in on verse 13 there. It says, Let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes, here it is, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. And so here you have in, in, the Lord's coming in judgment, and yet you have gladness, you have rejoicing, you have uh, uh, exaltation happening as he's coming to judge so once again look at look at psalm now look at psalm 98 uh, psalm 98 
starting with verse 4. And it's, it's really all over the place. Uh, you've heard this one. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with lyre, with the lyre the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of a horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. Here it is again. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples with equity. You know, we get in scripture, we get this praise, joy, joy rejoicing when there's judgment coming. How is that? How is that? Now, as far as justice itself, and this is relatively simple. I think we, we all can say, yes, I want justice. And there's a way to test this, by the way. So if you have somebody in the room with you, go ahead and, and turn to them and, and steal their wallet. And, and, and you see it right there, justice. Everybody wants justice. Uh, there, there, there's, something, there's something innately about us that we, we don't like that happening to us. We want justice. Uh, However, at the same time, we have the problem with this word judgment in our society, especially in our society. Don't judge me. Now, I'm going to give you an idea. Let's say we weren't living here. Um, let's say we were living in an environment which was completely oppressive. Uh, imagine you were in prison for what you believed. Uh, your family was taken from you wrongly just for what you believed as a Christian. Uh, maybe a differing political view and that caused you to be imprisoned, to be beaten. Maybe it was the color of your skin. Maybe you are in a situation in which you are being abused. You want judgment to come. You want your oppressor, your abuser, to be judged. You see how that changes the perspective on judgment? I mean, you and I make judgments all the time. We think, well, this is the right thing. Um, this is what is due. And, and, and so we believe that we should do this. Um, and, and so you and I make those judges. Where, where do we get... What's the source? Like, how do we, how are we informed, you know, what do we base those judgments on? And um, I propose that we can uh, base those judgments upon a few things. One of them, um, at least three things, and one of those is our conscience, um, what we think is right, um, what we think is wise, what we think is due, what is just. Uh, other things um, that we can use would be like public opinion. A mass of people believe we should go a certain way, or that this is the right thing to do, and so you know we believe that, that that's the way you should go. Um, a third thing would be civil laws. You know, so um, if something is legal, then I want to do it. If something is illegal, uh, then it's, it's probably wrong. Um, and so those are three things that inform uh, what we think is just. Uh, those things inform our judgments. However, they're not always good. Even when you put all three together, they're not, they're not necessarily good. For instance, uh, one clear example, I can think of several, but one clear example, um, up until 1965 in our country, we had the Jim Crow laws. And so let's take a look at that, based upon our conscience. Uh, were there several people, many people, who uh, believed, based upon their conscience, that this was a good law, that these, these were good things, uh, that we definitely needed to have segregation in the United States. That's horrible. People believe that. People believe that, that, based upon their conscience, they believed this was a good thing. Looking back on it now, what a tragedy. And so that's the conscious, uh, second public opinion. There was a large group of people if not the majority of people that actually believed in these laws as being good things for society. 
again, a huge tragedy. It's embarrassing to think of that as our country's history. And so public opinion, and of course civil laws, in itself was a law, they're, they're entitled Jim Crow laws. Somebody put his name on it. And, and, and so when we look at these three things, this is what informs our judgments. No wonder our judgment is, is, is not good. <laughs> there is a problem with the way in which you and I judge. The fourth source of judgment, or what informs judgment, is good. It's from God. It's God and the way in which he reveals himself. One of the ways he does that is through his word. Um, I think that this question cannot be asked, wouldn't be asked, by the person who has a, a correct understanding of the, the depths of their sin. I think this question, if you understood the human condition and the way in which God has revealed it to us, You wouldn't ask this question. I'll give you an example. This is a one uh, Christian author and leader, and, and he put it like this. And, and I can say these words for myself too. And um, I'm, I'm do this. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say these words for you as well. And if you don't agree with me, that that's that's fine. Um, but but listen to what he has to say. Um, quote. If you knew the full condition of my heart, my fantasies, my grievances, my anxieties, and my darkest solitary thoughts, you would declare me a danger to myself and others." End quote. Again, I would say that of myself, and I would say that of you as well. Now, my thoughts aren't all, and your thoughts aren't all bad. Um, actually, ma many of my thoughts are good thoughts, and so are yours. Many are, are kind and true. The author of this book puts it in a way which I, I loved. Um, it's like if you had a bag of flour, right? and it was infested with maggots, or with ants. It's, it's not all bad, but there's not one area that is pure. So it's really it's hard. To, uh, there, there's ample evidence to suggest that most of us are capable of evil and even cruelty, given the right amount of, of peer pressure. And that rot goes way deep into our very beings. And if we understand that, if we understand our own depravity, our own sinful natures, then we can't ask that question. How does a loving God send people to hell? I think we begin to reword that question, and that question soon becomes, how does a loving God, how does God save anybody at all? Here, uh, God's word, uh, Jeremiah chapter 17. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes. For its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought. For it does not cease to bear fruit. Here's what I'd like us to focus on. Verse 9, chapter 17. The heart is deceitful above all things. And it's desperately sick. Who can understand it? 
I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. I give to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Again, understanding that, those last two verses, the heart is deceitful above all things. We can't ask the question, how does loving God send people to hell? How does a loving God, how does God love anybody at all? And He does. That's the thing. There's an immense amount of mercy that we have with God through the Lord Jesus. We get a good taste of this mercy and love of God. Um, a picture we have in uh, Mark's Gospel. This is a uh, book of Mark, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Mark chapter 14. Uh, Mark chapter 14, uh, this particular episode in the earthly ministry of Jesus uh, and in the passion narrative of Jesus um, can be found in virtually all the other Gospels and all four Gospels. Um, and it's a scene in which Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and um, he's, he's praying to the Father. And so I'm going to be reading from uh, verse 32 of Mark 14 through verse 42. And there's one particular thing that I want us to take a look at. Um, it says, And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and he did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and, and taking your rest? It is enough, the hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So this is the account of the betrayal of the Lord Jesus. And the one thing I want us to focus on, and what did, and when he, as he's praying to the Father, what does he say? So he makes reference to this cup. Now, there's no cups around. This, he's in the garden. Um, what's the deal with the cup? Why, why a cup? Now, it could be that you know this this scene uh, comes right after the scene in which um, Jesus is with his disciples, and they're instituting the new covenant in which this is my blood in the covenant. There's a cup there, and there should be a, a distinction between a good and a bad cup. Maybe you have that there, possible. Um, however, more than that, you see, the language, especially going back to the Old Testament of cup, is, is a, a symbol of, of judgment. You know, drink this cup of, of judgment. And so here's Jesus referring to that judgment that he is about to receive. And so um, here we have a, a taste of the mercy, you know, the judgment of God, you know, poured out upon Jesus. The wrath of God that was due you and I, Christian. Was poured on Jesus, and 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 with, by no merit of our own, do we have we earned that? You know, we think of of the cross. Um, 
when we think of uh, the blood and we think of the nails and the, the crown of thorns and the shame, the, the fact that Jesus was by himself, alone. And, and, and that's, that's very disturbing and, and painful as it is. However, it's kind of like you know, uh, uh, the way in which a marriage ceremony or a marriage uh, points us towards a deeper love. The picture we have of the cross and what we see there actually points to a deeper pain. That the judgment that is due to you was poured out upon him. The, the judgment that was due to for all his people were poured out upon him, upon that cross. God himself taking it himself, absorbing it himself in your place. If you understand that, how could we even ask that question? How can a loving God send people to hell? How does God save anybody? And, and, and knowing my own heart, how does God save me? How, how is that possible? Why me? I think that's the question we should be asking. And so if if maybe you're watching this and you do not and you do not know this mercy and this love, this is uh, a good time to to get to know the Lord and, and, and to see what he what he um, has for you. This is a free offer of grace and mercy. And he says, here, this is yours. This is a gift. Come follow me. Come follow me. Um, anybody here at Calvary would love to be able to talk with you about that and um, help you along with those next steps. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you for the great mercy and love that you have for your people. Lord, we thank you for the free grace that you have uh, so graciously offered us. Uh, Lord, we, we, we see your goodness. Uh, we see um, how you have cared for us, how you call people out of darkness and into your marvelous light. And Lord, yes, we rejoice. We Exalt, we praise you for the day to come when you are to come and judge the world. Because we know that the end will be for your glory and that you have saved your people by great love. I pray this, Father, in the name, the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, so long. Hope to see you soon.